Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a huge collection of videos on monster ecology, fantasy world history, cosmology, character classes and magic items on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button down below or backing me on Patreon where you get access to all the scripts I write for these vids if you prefer to read what I'm saying. I also have a Discord server with an active community and of course subscribe to me here for two video uploads per week and a live stream every weekend. This week we are crossing the streams with some research brought to you by my very long time friend and fellow sage Red NZ Blue. Link to his channel below. I will take it as a personal favour if you would be so kind to go to his channel after watching this and explore his other research and help him get his channel up and running. He certainly deserves it. Now, Red enjoys creating an in-world persona for his video series, a lecturer at the Conclave of Silvery Moon, while I am more of a sage of Candlekeep. So when he sent me this research for presentation on my channel, he wrote it very much in the style of a guest lecturer sage. But in order to maintain that in-world roleplay, I'd have to cut out a lot of information from the video because the people on the world of Toril just don't know a lot of things that viewers of my videos do. So they don't know that the Mulan people have their origins on the world called Earth, for instance. So please forgive me, Red. I have to be true to my usual style, as much fun as it was reading your research and transporting myself to that lecture theatre in Silvery Moon. A lot of the past in researching the history of Faerun is fragmented stories and second-hand accounts. Cataclysms are often pieced together after the fact. Archaeologists make educated guesses. So much is built on top of the bones and dust of what came before. The span of eons on the world of Toril has seen empires rise and fall, many lost to us apart from fragments. Many of these fragments are bound up in one of the most secretive arts, that of Arcana. For example, we know that giants have a runic language and runic magic all their own, but the full record of it is almost completely lost to us. However, when we encounter tales of the magic of giant kind and the ancient empire of Astoria, we can make a pretty educated guess that rune magic was involved. And when searching for remnants of their lost era, we look for those runes, not paper scrolls, not illustrated spell books, for the giants had neither of these. A perfect example of piecing together a picture based not on hard physical evidence, but rather putting clue and clue together, is our knowledge of the Orc Gates and the origin of Orcish culture on Toril. Orcs came to Toril from some other world. The first time this happened was so long ago that whatever remains of the portal that were has long since been destroyed in the resulting warfare. But the location of the gate is sort of known. There are popular theories, and in the latter instance of the portal to an Orc world, we know even more. And there are actual accounts. From the records of Thay, we know that the Grey Orcs invaded the surrounding region, and that the Orc god Grumsh slew the new god Ray in the first witnessed and recorded instance of Diocide. But let's start at the beginning and show you how sages have put together the theory for the first Orc gate. The Batraki are one of the so-called creator races, an amphibioid race, similar in appearance to the swamp-dwelling Bollywug race, and many believe the Sladi are quite close to their original appearance. The Batraki Empire rose to power in the ancient days of thunder some 35,000 years ago. We know that they were masters of teleportation and summoning magics, and they developed a rune system for making contact with other planes of existence and other cosmic spheres. Theirs was a pan-dimensional, multi-sphere empire occupying many worlds and many realms, but it fell to a combination of cosmic disaster, environmental upheaval, and a fatal war with the giants back when the fabled titans were much more active on Toril. At the time, it's extremely likely that the Batraki constructed and opened either one or many portals within the spine of the world mountains to give them a huge tactical advantage over the giants and to summon forth beings within the giant's domain to cause widespread chaos and devastation behind enemy lines. We know the Batraki could summon primordials, using some of their own power to keep the gateway open. See, back then, temporary portals that didn't require massive edifices and huge sources of cosmic power were unknown on the world of Toril, at least among mortal beings, so there could well be evidence of these portal sites deep in the mountains even now. What we do know though is that at some point the Batraki discovered a world with orcs on it 
and brought over an unknown but substantial number of them to infest the mountains and raid the resources of the giants, who have always required huge amounts of food for obvious reasons. It was a sound tactical move by the Batraki, I think, but the long-term consequences have been with us ever since. The first mention of the savage mountain orcs in recorded elven history appears nearly 26,000 years ago, when the sun elf city of Osidian was sacked and destroyed by a horde of orcs led by the abyssal fiend Heishka. The city was destroyed in the year of singing sirens when the huge orc horde, the giant's resources depleted and now with thousands of orcs starving, rushed over many parts of the northern continent. The orcs managed to overrun the northern plains and plunge deep into the forests. Many elven circles of High Magai had bonded with their brothers and sisters in the Tower of Ossidian, so when the orcs broke the wards and destroyed the tower as they sacked the city of Song, a magical backlash killed many of the high magicians in other cities like Salarian. It was a brutal disaster that broke the spirit of the elven people within what was now known as the High Forest for many years. The city of Sharlarian remarkably rallied itself with the forewarning of this linked peril and by the time the demon drove the horde at them, they managed to repel the invasion and annihilated the bulk of the orc forces. But the orcs were not broken and neither were the elves and the two cultures had met implacable foes in each other. With an enmity that lasts to this very day, I could debate that the orcs never asked to be trapped on Faerun and used as tools of war. Nor could we really condemn them completely, knowing that a demon was behind their march on elven lands, preying on the orcs' desperation and hunger. And did the Sun Elves not also have extensive dealings with demons later in their turbulent history? So, history shines a light on our own bias, uncomfortable as it is. Now, the legacy of the Batraki portal magic was far from done, and again, it's deeply involved in the fate of the orc people. The Imaskari were an ancient race of people who ruled Imaska, a land that has since been divided into the lands of Mulharand, Untha and Thay. Their greatest minds made huge advances in magical theory and especially in transportation magic. It is written that they had a class of magic users known as the Theurge, people who practiced both arcane and divine magic, mastering both with equal proficiency up to and including those of ninth level and possibly beyond spells. It's said that the Emaskari command over portal magic was made primarily through the research of Batraki theorems. It's assumed that the Emaskari found and decoded the Batraki rune language that led to their own portal creations. If we assume, therefore, that the original portal of the Orcs was also Batraki in origin, it certainly has the ring of truth to it. The spine of the World Mountains at that time fell within the Batraki Empire of Nadezha, and before that the Grand Saruk Empire. The Saruk themselves were serpentine masters of many magics, including the creation of the first portals across what was then the supercontinent of Faerun, and then interdimensional portals that allowed individuals to step from one world to another. A mind-boggling achievement by anyone's standards. The enormous insight of the Saruk was largely thanks to an organisation within their culture named the Ba'atith who meticulously sought out all mysticism and magic across the ancient world and all the cultures they discovered, collecting them and analysing them for over 4,000 years and condensing this wisdom down to 50 scrolls inscribed on enchanted precious metal paper they named the Golden Skins of the World Serpent, their god. These were later known more commonly as the Nether Scrolls and they have been arguably the most influential artefacts on not just the world of Toril but many spheres of the multiverse. Based on the findings of adventurers who have explored some parts of the Spine of the World Mountains, which is a very large region with often extremely harsh and dangerous conditions. I mean, some of the mountains in this range stand over 20,000 feet tall, and all but the smallest are covered in snow and ice for every day of the year. Sages have some confidence that the main, perhaps the original, mountain orc portal site is at or near Kuldahar, and that the powerful and mysterious Heartstone Gem was a vital part of it. There are a number of clues. The perpetual summer conditions of Kuldahar, the otherworldly origin of the Great Oak located there, the fact that the Heartstone Gem has the power to see what is normally hidden from standard divination, and that it requires tremendous magical or divine power to even use it, the fact that it has been coveted by snake-worshipping cultists and a Marilith demon, 
and that its power, far from diminished over the eons, only seems to be increasing, hinting to a link to some other locus of cosmic power. Perhaps the exact location will never be rediscovered. Who knows? The more recent portal and arrival of Orcish culture was much later, and much more recent. This time spurred by the actions of a rebellious Imaskari theurgist named Thade, 2,573 years ago. Thade was the last apprentice of the remnants of the true Imaskari wizards. He was deeply involved in the political unrest of the Mulharandi and Antheric nations, and was planning to incite the wizards of those nations to join him in open war against the ruling god kings. Remember, the Imaskari wizards had quite a different view on gods, particularly those who physically manifested and sat on thrones. Thade used ancient portal magic and opened a fateful portal to a brutal world dominated by empires of fanatically religious orcs. These are the Grey Orcs, a distinct ancestry and culture quite different from the Mountain Orcs who were known on the world of Toril up until this point. The gate was open and stable and Thade began the second part of his plan, but unfortunately he was captured along with his conspirators and executed, leaving a portal open to another world for the next five years without anyone knowing it was there. Five years later though, the orcs suddenly poured out of that portal in an enormous invasion force that laid siege to both Mulharind and Unther for the next six years. Far more fanatical than the mountain orcs of the north, the invading grey orcs and their clerics had the literal power of the orcish gods on their side, which is what leads me to think that the orcs all came originally from the same planet or perhaps the same sphere with multiple occupied planets. And we do know they are closely related cultures out beyond the spheres. With the scroll travelling the phlogiston and being quite an active spell jamming culture. Anyway, the grey orcs were equipped with amazingly powerful and deadly spells. The most potent of magics being their ability to directly call down avatars of their deities. Avatars of the gods of Mulharund and Unther also dwelt on Faerun, but weakened after the oppression under the Amaskari Empire, were ill-equipped to defend against the Orc hordes. For the first time, mortals witnessed the death of a god at the hand of another god. Certainly nothing new for Grimsh. In religious folklore, he's one of the most fearsome of the many deities in existence. The land now known as Thay is really the region where this conflict was the most intense and was the staging ground for the Orcish forces. The desperate Malharandi were forced to recruit mercenaries to help them quench the Orc hordes. Among them were the warriors of the tribes of Na, Reshemi, and Sosram. But it was the battle between the pantheons that really decided the outcome of this mortal war, and the battle of the gods was just another skirmish in a war which had been going on for a very long time. The Dragonfall War is a conflict between the draconic followers of Bahamut and Tiamat, part of the fundamental religious schism known as the Draco Holy Wars. And before you ask why dragons have such an important role in a battle between orc and human pantheons, we only need to take a look at the history of Unther and its manifested gods. See, when the Emaskari took slaves from ancient earth, they put a magical barrier between these humans and their gods, who at the time resided in a plane called Ziggaraxis. But those gods, which included Tiamat, figured out a way to bypass the barrier and travel via the astral plane to Toril, and they were forced to physically manifest themselves, which drove the slaves to overthrow the Emaskari Empire and create the Untheric civilization for themselves. As they arrived on Toril without an invitation, so to speak, that pantheon was never particularly popular among the other gods, while the pantheon of Mulharund was actually invited to Toril by Ao himself. Anyway, in the conflict with the fully charged and operational Orcish pantheon, the Untheric gods were seriously outgunned and outmatched. No less than seven of them were killed in the Orc Gate War, and Tiamat was banished to the Nine Hells, which is how she ended up being stuck there. The Orc forces were seriously depleted by this massive conflict with two great empires, and their gods though, and the Grey Orc population never recovered enough to stake a claim to a territory all their own, not even Thay but they are nomadic anyway, so Tiamat's schemes were far from over, of course. Despite the unexpected setback, she was not giving up on her claw hold on Toril and ended up gathering enough cultists to elevate her once more to godhood. She fought Gilgim, got her tail kicked, but sprang back to power again and this time wiped him out. 
and the drastically reduced Untheric pantheon then dissolved, with Tiamat and Asurin finally joining the Firunian pantheon, sort of officially. How long this lasts, who knows. As for the Grey Orcs, they are a nomadic people, unlike the Mountain Orcs who are prone to form a very large and well-established tribe, such as the Kingdom of Obold Many Arrows. One thing is for certain, the Orcs are part of Toril. They have been for many tens of thousands of years in the far north, and several thousand years in the ancient empires and the southern lands. Their pantheon and the unique cultures are here to stay. A great deal of thanks to Red NZ Blue for this research and insight on this very topical lore. We uh, both hope that you enjoyed it. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for all the full scripts for these videos, buy some sweet merchandise from my Teespring shop, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.